that we worked on a while back, and, and I just, one of the things that we were proud of, we think that, and the two-step method brochure is still a really popular download on our site. We're still something that we use in our education programs all the time. Another project that came uh, through early in my tenure was uh, school. And public schools uh, are, are like any institution. They have pest control programs. They have pests. Um, and uh, back in the, in, I think it was the early 1980s, and I can't remember the exact year, um, a school district in Chillicothe, in, outside of Wichita Falls, called Chillicothe ISD, um, had a problem with head lice with their school children. And the school board decided that uh, that was not a good thing, and nobody could seem to get rid of the problem, and they couldn't get them off the kids. The parents were complaining, so they decided they'd take a little pest control in their own hands. And they went out and they, they got their toxophenes and other uh, cotton insecticides out off the farm shelf and decided to spray down the school, including the buses and the locker room and lockers of the school. And um, guess what? When the teachers and students came back to school, they started getting sick. And the health department found out about it and closed them down indefinitely. They closed the whole school district down. Um, and you can see some of the headlines, mice infestations lead to pesticide nightmare. Uh, school buildings that chill a coffee called tainted. And actually, they ended up with a, with a really emergency cleanup crew. They ended up clearing those uh, buildings, and I think within two weeks they were back open again. But um, it, it was called, called a classic example of chemical misuse. Now, that, that incident probably would be forgotten by most people, except there was one parent in the school district that um, about eight years later became a state legislator. And guess what? He introduced a bill that required all schools in Texas to, um, to have something called ICM, Integrated Test Management. How many of you are familiar with that? Okay. So um, this legislation required uh, all districts to have an ICM program in place by 1995, and um, then enforcement of the, rule, the law would take place by the Texas Structural <laughs> Health Control Board. Now, since that time, enforcement of the rules have been taken over by the Department of Agriculture. Um, I was fortunate to be able to be in this intermediate time uh, when the rules were actually being developed and got to have some input in the, into those rules. But uh, as of this year, we're celebrating 22 years of, of a mandatory school IPM in Texas. I think, I think we've made some uh, inroads into the uh, way we do pest control in schools. So the essentials of the regulation is for IPM is required for each school. Now, this is actually pretty significant because a lot of other states about around this time were considering um, IPM and trying to promote IPM. The EPA was supporting the IPM concept. Um, but a lot of the state efforts were focused more on restricting pesticide use rather than promoting integrated pest management, which are two very different things if you understand IPM. Um, now, under the rules, there had to be a policy in place for each district. Now, that doesn't sound like uh, maybe uh, significant, but in a, within a school district, the policy is like law. It's, it's a, something you have to follow by requiring the districts to have a a policy that they were going to follow the, the state law that basically codifies the, the requirement within each school district. It also required that each district would have uh, someone called an IPM coordinator, who's a person that oversees the, the whole uh, pest management program for the school district. And uh, in many of our smaller schools, it may be the lead bus driver that's the IPM coordinator, or it may be the law, chief lawnmower who is that person. But there has to be someone who's ultimately familiar with the rules and in charge of that for the whole district. Um, districts also are, are required to have IPM plans for key pests, uh, which include they have to have a regular sampling monitoring program. They have to keep good records. And they have to educate their school staff about the IPM program. And there's also a system within the regulations that encouraged use of what we call green pesticides. We had uh, three levels, green, yellow, and red. And the system uh, re basically requires more paperwork if you're going to use the yellow or red product. Uh, every, any, any school can use any pesticide, but uh, if they do make it a little more difficult bureaucratically to use the more toxic pesticides. 
And we, we started in 2001, this is about six years after the rules were passed, um, we, we started getting organized and um, developed a, a regular regional training uh, series of training classes for school districts. And uh, I do this with, with some other colleagues. Um, this is Dr. Don Ranchi here and um, doing one of the very first school IPM training. So we, we do this in four locations, north, south, east, and west every year, and uh, have school districts coming to that. Uh, this, it makes us really happy when we see a school district truck pull up and see IPM on the, on the door, because this is not a concept schools have ever historically embraced. Uh, we do a lot of hands-on type training, or we try to build as much as we can into each class. Each class, we try to get out of the classroom and, and go walk, walk the school and talk IPM, and that's one of the more popular parts of the class. Now, just to give, this, I wanted to just give you a flavor of what we try to get across to these school IPM coordinators. So, I want to give you a little uh, school IPM analogy. Uh, so, how many? of you in the last uh, couple months have been in to see the doctor. Okay. So when you, and for all of us, when you go in to see the doctor, what do you expect to happen when you walk into, when he walks into the examination room with, with you? What kind of questions, what kind of things is he going to do, he or she going to do? Take your okay, take the temperature. That might be a first thing to do. What else? Check your insurance, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else? <laughs> what? I don't have to you. Okay, I'm hoping they're going to take the medical records, right? Yeah. <laughs> what else? Blood pressure. Blood, blood pressure, blood sample, you know, whatever kind of issues do you have. Uh, there's going to be probably some tests being run. Uh, what, what's your medication history? What are you taking right now? A lot of those types of questions to investigate who you are to tell your, your treatment. So suppose you walk into the doctor's office and you see this guy. <laughs> And Dr. Parker, he looks you in the eye and he says, I know what you need. And he whips out that hypodermic syringe and starts to come at you. What would you do? I believe. I love you. What is that? What is that? So um, this is kind of how we've been doing pest control for the last 50 years, isn't it? If you, if you know anything about pest control, is what what a, a business or school expects is they expect to pay the bug guy money to come in and monthly go around the school and spray. And that's that's really what we're trying to get away from with integrated pest management. Integrated pest management is based more on finding out what the problem is, what's there, and what needs to be treated, and, and choosing tr appropriate treatment methods. And hopefully it's not always going to be um, this guy, okay, with that needle. So, um, anyway, the, the, we have a team. It's, uh, we call it ourselves uh, the Southwest Technical Resource Center for School IPM. And that initially, we started this team with a grant from the U.S. EPA. Um, it, it granted, allowed us to hire this lady right here, uh, Janet Hurley. She's a colleague of mine up at the Dallas Center. And uh, she is full-time working on school IPM-related Program. Uh, Dr. Don Ranchi here is the associate department head for ag and environmental safety, uh, located in, across the, the road here, and uh, and he's been an integral part of our program. He's a very popular speaker. Uses humor in the classroom to to get people to remember things, and, and it's been very very successful. And then we try to incorporate other faculty. This is Dr. Matt Elmore, who is our uh, recent uh, turf grass specialist uh, who helped us out last year with one of our classes to try to get experts from pathology and turf grass and others to help us because a lot of the pesticides that are used in school districts are actually outdoor pesticides and pound for pound a lot more pounds of insecticide and herbicides are used outdoors uh, on school grounds and where is the number one place that we use pesticides in schools? Sports field. This is Texas, right? Football field. Uh, football is king here in Texas. Yeah. 
And now we've got fake turf. <laughs> we do have a lot of fake turf in Dallas, but it, it's not everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so by the numbers, uh, between 2009 and 2016, we trained 1,136 school, independent school district staff uh, from 680, 668 school districts. Um, now, if we figured out all the school districts, but the school children represented by all the people we trained, we estimated we, we impacted indirectly 3.2 million Texas children through these programs. And, and that's, this just shows you the power of, of working with pesticide applicators, um, people that are professional pest management. We couldn't possibly impact that many people by directly teaching them, nor would they probably be interested. But these folks are interested because it's part of their job, it's a requirement, and most, the majority of them want to do it right. This is a recent class that we had, and I think uh, about, what was it, 28 out of 30 some people that were there were brand new IPM coordinators. We had a chance to, to give them the IPM analogy and get them thinking in, in an IPM manner and getting some tools and knowledge of, of what they can do uh, to control pests safely. Now, we also put out a newsletter, and this has been going on for a number of years. Um, it started out as a paper newsletter, now it's electronic, of course. Uh, we reached uh, 1,700 subscribers, including uh, over 1,000 school IPM coordinators. And uh, we said there were 252 um, uh, different counties in Texas. There's uh, 1,026, I believe, uh, school districts in Texas. And each one is independent of the other, so, uh, and each one has to have an IPM program. And we also have a school IPM website that uh, last year received eight, over almost 19,000 visitors. Now, we, we also tried to measure our impact for this program several times. And uh, again, this is challenging. Uh, we've done different approaches, including going out and doing site surveys and doing analysis of books and, and looking at records of schools and things that, that we've trained. But uh, the, the survey is still a really useful tool. And there was actually a graduate student here, one of Dr. Gold's students, in Shawdrock back in 1994. Uh, they conducted the very first study, and we're glad that he did, because he did this in 93, which was before the school IPM rules went into effect. And uh, he, he had 517 of the, 10, of the 1,046 at the time school districts that he surveyed. In 2005, about 10 years after the law went into effect, we did another mail survey and got, got results from uh, 500, over 500 school districts, almost half, over half the schools. 2016, we did another uh, online questionnaire. This time, we did it with a version of a survey software that could be uh, downloaded on the phone. And uh, we got a much smaller sample size this time, around 200 respondents. Um, but um, apparently it's getting harder to get people to respond to surveys, even the people that we uh, know. But uh, in any case, we've used this data to help us understand what the impact of our programs are. Now, today we know that about only about 20% of school districts uh, report that they routinely apply insecticides um, to schools uh, compared to when they're needed. Needed. Back in 94, it was near, nearly 100% of school districts, we estimate, did routine pesticide application. 72% um, of schools monitor crawling insects with sticky traps. One of the, one of the, the uh, criteria that the Texas Department of Agriculture uses when they go into a school and measure whether they're doing, following the IPM rules, is whether they're trapping for bugs. And um, if you don't have uh, the 24-7 traps out, mm -hmm. chances are you're not doing a very good job monitoring and you don't have any way of, of uh, recording what the changes in your pest populations are. Um, today, 44% 40, of schools never or rarely apply what we call baseboard spraying, which is going through the school and, and spraying the edges of the walls. There's not too many pests that live on the edges of the walls, but that's just been a traditional way of applying a pesticide to a building uh, historically. We asked the school coordinators that took the survey um, if the, the ITM rules and regulations had resulted in more effective pest management for their districts. 
and uh, over three quarters of them felt that it was, that the school rules were improving um, the pest control, the way their district did pest control. And um, one of the big criticisms of school IPM uh, is that it's too expensive, it's too much of a bother, it, it increases our operating costs. And um, we asked the coordinators uh, in 2016, besides the cost of essential pest control rules, the rules and regulations have for, uh, posed no financial burden for our school district, and we asked them if they agreed or disagreed with that statement, you can see 65% of them agreed with the statement that there wasn't really any uh, significant additional cost to uh, doing IPM versus old pest control. Now, this was actually very helpful to us. A couple of years ago, uh, the Texas legislature, actually twice in recent years, the Texas legislature has considered uh, repealing the school IPM bill. The only reason that we can figure is that some principals got the ears of some conservative legislators and said, hey, you know, this is one of these, these rules, government rules that are intrusive that we don't need. And so bills were introduced to try to, to, try to take away the rule requirements for IPM. And, and fortunately, uh, cooler heads prevailed and the, uh, the uh, laws did not pass, the repeals did not pass. And part of it was due to the data that we were able to collect through the survey. Um, Jen Hurley especially has been very active nationally in school IPM and, and keeps up with other states and recently published an American Entomologist article about the impact of, of school rules on, I, on school IPM. And um, she's concluded, and many others have concluded, that Texas probably has the, the most progressive and uh, comprehensive school IPM rules in the U.S. And uh, we think that our program has been relatively successful, and, and these are some of the reasons we think that it has been. For one thing, it mandates licensing and training. In a lot of states, you don't even have to have a pesticide applicator's license to apply pesticides in school. Um, the focus of our law is, not on, is on IPM, not on just restricting pesticide use. So we're not taking tools away from school districts. We're just encouraging them to use the safer tools. And in Texas, we've actually appointed somebody to um, dedicated somebody to work with public schools, and that's uh, Janet Hurley's position. We, I, I say we have one and a quarter full-time equivalent positions dedicated to school IPM. I'm including myself and Dr. Ranchi and part of that. And um, the other thing is we've got a, a regulatory agency that really enforces the rules. They go out they, every year and affect 20% of the school districts in the state. And so over, over five years, the idea is that every school district receives a, an inspection visit, and if they're not in compliance, um, they, they get referred to us uh, or one of the other training groups so that they can get re-educated. And not all of our efforts have been totally successful. This is, this is a uh, meeting that we uh, helped organize in 2009, and it was, a, it was an organizational meeting to try to get school districts to form uh, the IPM coordinators from different school districts. Remember, every district has to have a coordinator. We tried to get them to form their own association. And uh, we, had, we had the association come together in 2009. They called themselves TIP, TIP Maps, which stood for Texas IPM Affiliates for Public School. And uh, had a very successful meeting with over 200 uh, people present. I think there were somewhere around 150 or so school districts out of the 1,000 plus school districts in the state. So a, a very good turnout of school districts for this. And uh, this group went on and kept meeting for several years, uh, but it has since petered out. And um, we we decided we didn't we wanted the main thing we were shooting for here was sustainability. We wanted a program that would be self-sustaining, and we hoped this group would be self-sustaining, but it turned out not to be. And we think that, we've talked about this a lot, we think that a lot of the reason is that schools are not used to having people in this kind of position be in a professional association. That they're expected to be on the school, you know, seven days a week, and, and in case there's any emergencies, and it's very difficult to find volunteers from within these ranks that uh, want to give time to helping run an association. At least that's, that's the best explanation we can get what we see with the people that did volunteer. 
So anyway, we think that we made a valiant effort here, but I'm not sure if this is going to be revived or not.